Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Calm. Calm is the meditation app that has literally hundreds of hours of content. And right now, Calm is offering my listeners 40% off if you go to calm.com slash holly. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash holly. Don't take my word for it. Go and check out the over 1 million five-star reviews on their app. That's calm.com slash holly. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before we start, I want to give a quick shout out to my sponsors at Manscaped. Everyone, Father's Day is coming up. And if you're looking for the perfect gift to give the man in your life, you definitely want to give them the Performance Package 4.0, which of course includes their revolutionary trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. And if you use code Holly at manscaped.com, you will get 20% off plus free shipping. Okay, let's welcome our amazing guest today. She is a stand up comedian with a porn perspective. She's done stand up all around the US, telling jokes and stories about her eight years of experience in the adult industry, including at this year's Netflix is a Joke comedy special. She also brings her unique background in porn, comedy, and medicine to her sex education podcast, Sexy, Funny, Raw. Let's welcome Sylvia Sage. Thank you, Holly. Hi. I was actually just thinking as you were reading that, I was like, oh, for Father's Day. And then you described like manscaping. And I'm like, oh, I don't have a husband. But I was like, what a awkward gift to give to my father. But I would do it. And he would think it was hilarious. So. <laughs> well, you can also, what also comes in the performance package port point out is a, the weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer. Oh, oh see that? He would love. Older men need. And their boxer briefs yeah. are um, actually, to be honest, they're very comfortable. Very comfortable. Yeah, my husband, because, you know, they send me stuff and I give it to my husband. Yeah, and, uh, of course. He loves them. Okay, see, but my dad would really, he's like, you know, he's got a new wife and, you know, tries to keep there things spicy. Yeah. So, you know, there's always a, that was a cute little gift idea. I was like, when is Father's Day? I don't even know when it's happening. Uh, it's a Sunday in June. It's a Sunday in June. Okay. It's some Sunday in June. Got it. Okay. But I don't know which one. All right. Got it. But it is coming. It's <laughs> it coming. is coming. We yes. have to prepare to manscape our men. And yes. I, I, uh, I do cock ratings a lot, obviously, to me jump right into things. Too. Sorry. But me I, too. I judge on manscaping. Yes. And I tell them, yes. if you would have just... Trim that up. Oh your points would have went up. I judge on background. I judge on everything. If I see a toilet, it's a point off. Like I just don't put a toilet in a view of your penis. It's not sexy. I feel like you and I are the same person <laughs> because you've literally just described everything that I do as well. I also do dick ratings on yeah. my OnlyFans. Yes. But a lot of women that I've spoken to who do that, yes, taking all the guy thinks about it, he's like, is my penis big enough? Right. But what men don't understand is that like the size of your dick is actually Mm-mm. not that important. Mm-mm. It's everything else around mm-hmm. it is what we take into mm-hmm. account. So what are the things that you look for specifically that make for a good, a dick, good pic? dick pic? So I want it to be a sexy pose. So I want it to be probably like when you're in bed or in the shower is pretty hot. I'm okay with those things. And I want a uh, perspective. So I want either your hand on it or it next to another object so I can actually see length because I figure like some angles can be very deceiving. Yes. I want manscaping. And if there's anything in the background, it better be clean, uh, mm-hmm. whether it's a mirror or sheets or the floor underneath you, whatever it is, pick it up, clean it, make sure it's like good. That's all I really want. I just want cleanliness in and around the penis. And then I want something to give me like size reference and then I'm happy. Yeah. And then I can judge from there. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm definitely the same way. All of those things, like if the bed is made, is that, that's my um, oh. lipstick. Oh, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, if the bed is made, the room has to be clean. Yes. Like, cause I'm looking at your room. Cause I'm assuming that like, you know, if, if I'm looking at your penis in, in real life, mm-hmm. we would probably be about to have sex. Right. If you have like a disgusting room, I'm then not sleeping with you. it's not happening. Thank you. I agree 100% <laughs> because I'm looking at this dick to me. Like, am I turned on by it? What, yeah. how much am I turned on by looking at this photo? And if everything around it is bad, I'm like, I'm not turned on. I don't want to, I don't want to have sex with that. I'm yeah. just not. <laughs> Cause it's not like about that disembodied appendage. It's no. about, the per- it's really about the person, person. connected to it. Mm-hmm. 
And it's just, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah. How do you, so can I ask, are you honest with your dick ratings or are you like, do you try to be kind? I'm honest with a kind background. So I'm honest in the point of like, I'll tell you why I'm taking off points. Mm -hmm. Um, But are these things that they can help? Like manscaping, fixing their room. Obviously you can't do anything about penis size. Right. So I never actually, I don't go below a five because I think that's offensive and hurtful. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to ever make somebody feel like less than. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been made to feel like less than my entire life. So I try not to do that to people. Mm -hmm. So I give like inspiration of ways they can fix it. Of Mm -hmm. I'll say, you know, clean up your background or trim, trim that things you can do to actually fix it. And then with some realness, I mean, obviously if I'm giving you a nine, which I won't give anyone a 10 rating because I don't think you can judge a penis without knowing the person. knowing mm-hmm. well knowing how it operates like I would have to like actually have sex with you mm-hmm. to give a full 10 rating I think but from views I'll give as much as like a nine and a half and if you get a nine or a nine and a half for me that means that like I would like to jump on that penis like mm-hmm. I am truly interested because that looks really fun yeah yeah <laughs> so which can be anything from like size wise, again, it's not like the size. Now, if it's a micro penis, obviously that's a little different of a situation. Um, but I think anything of like a five, six inches, like good for me. I'm happy as long as I can just grind on it. That's all I really need is just my clit, you know? And I like all sorts of angles. So I'm like a big, anal girl. I blame that on porn because I think I've been so overstimulated for so many years that I just need all parts. I just need Mm -hmm. you kissing my neck and putting things in my vagina and in my butt and probably something on my clit. It's Mm -hmm. a, it's a circus going on when you're having sex with me. (laughs) It's not like a one man show. But like everyone has fun at the circus. So thank you. Thank you. Just welcome yourself to the big tent that is Sylvia. (laughs) Yeah. No, have you ever gotten a micro penis submission? Yeah. And what I've seen them in real life too. I've had them in real life. I've, that's never happened to me. Yeah, I have. It's what do a, you do? Um, you just try to be empathetic and try to be, I'm such a big crusader of just like making people feel good about mm-hmm. themselves. So I will just never be negative. I'm, you know, I'm just always going to say something that is some way a good thing. What? Do you, what? <laughs> No, because honestly, like I feel terrible. If I, I'm not yeah. trying to like body yeah. shame guys no, with small penises because I really do. Yeah. Like I really do feel like, you know, that must be really tough, tough. for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially with all this emphasis on how we, what we put on penis size and stuff. Mm-hmm. And this, you know, women, like if you have no boobs, you can get implants. Right. Like with men, I mean, I think, I know there are penis implants, but I don't, I don't really know exactly how well they work, but yeah, like what? But I don't know. Like that's where do? I would like probably compliment like their balls or something mm-hmm. like that, or even their technique of like um, cutilingus or something mm-hmm. like that. Be like, oh my god, but you're so good at eating my pussy, or you make me feel so special, or things of that nature. Mm-hmm. I've definitely learned to find. I attribute this to porn. Learn to find something in every human that's attractive. Because there's a lot of times you show up to set and I'm like, I do not want to have sex with this person. But mm-hmm. I just find something in them, whether it be looking into their eyes and trying to look into their soul and feel something about them. Or maybe I like the way their shoulders are or something on their body. I just have to find and make it attractive to me. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I can do that <laughs> with almost anyone at wow. this point <laughs> and just make them feel like some sort of connection with me, you mm-hmm. know? Cause I think that's big and important too, is having that connection. So you mm-hmm. have to find some way to connect with them. So that's what I would do with a small penis. I wouldn't make it about their dick. I would make yeah. it about everything else about them. Right. Right. It's interesting. (laughs) It's interesting that you kind of talk about how porn has actually made you like a better communicator and somebody who can, who looks for the good in people and who looks for that connection. Because as you know, you know, so often the rhetoric is porn disconnects you from the body. It objectifies women Mm -hmm. It objectifies sex. It makes it less special. It makes it a job, Mm -hmm. but it sounds like it's kind of did the opposite for you. Yeah. Honestly, I felt really disconnected as a person in sex for a very long time myself. And so porn for me took me out of a place of feeling not good enough to a point of like, now I'm the prize, you know, porn Mm -hmm. took me out of the place where I was like, oh my God, I hope he wants to sleep with me. Like, I hope he'll call me for a second date to like, 
why would I need to have him call me for a second date? Like I am the prize value. So now I want to make everyone feel like they are the prized value. And porn gave me such a confidence boost to be able to do that. I just feel like, I don't know, it's weird because it's just not what most people think, but I feel like porn did make me a better person because it made me see life from all angles. I was a white woman who worked in medicine for a decade prior to that. I had respect from anyone I wanted it from. And then I came into porn and the world made me feel like a secondhand human. And I was like, oh my God, this is what it feels like to be this sub level. And then my empathy just kicked in and made me just this better person all around. Are you saying that like from the stigma that you face from being a sex worker? Yes. Okay. <laughs> because I feel like the moment I started telling people I do porn, I just got shoved aside by so many people. I mean, people in my family, people I considered friends, um, old work colleagues, uh, complete strangers. I have introduced myself as a porn actress in mid conversation, people have turned around and walked away from me. Like I wasn't even worth continuing the conversation with. So it just really opened up a whole new world of how I don't ever feel like I treated people that way. I feel like, um, I was raised by a family of people who saw everyone as like equals. My grandfather delivered milk, you know, and I used to clean toilets. Like I've never felt I was above anybody. So I've always kind of had that. I never looked down on anybody else, but I also never had the empathy of being a trash human to other people. So when I became a trash person to people, I was like, wow, this feels really shitty. And that's been like a big goal of mine is to change how people view women in sexuality Mm because people don't view men that way. Mm -hmm. When a man has a big sexual appetite or works in porn or is a George Clooney or a, you know, one of these playboy types in Hollywood, they're revered as like, oh my God, if I could be with that person. But a female is like the exact opposite way of Mm -hmm. like, oh, what a disgusting person. And Mm -hmm. if you were to marry a porn star, all of your friends and your family would talk shit about you and they would talk down about how your wife has just been railed by everybody. Instead of talking talking about how your wife is a sexual fucking pro Mm -hmm. and can dominate you in the bedroom and how fun that must be and how amazing it must be to her for her to choose you as the guy she wants to be with when she could be with anyone in the whole world. You know, it's a, it's a weird double dynamic and it made me yeah, made me a better person. It's interesting when you say that about men, because I don't know why immediately it came to mind Ron Jeremy. And obviously before the sexual assault yeah. allegations came out and he ended up in jail. Yeah. Um, you he know, people- as a hero. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think <sighs> like, I think we can all agree that he's not particularly attractive. No, he's disgusting. He's But yeah. like guys, I think guys love that about him because yes. it was like, oh my God, this guy's not attractive yet. He gets all these women. Mm-hmm. Like he's my hero. Yes. Whereas if you're, God forbid, should you be- what someone might consider an unattractive porn Mm -hmm. star as a female, like Mm -hmm. not the same. Yeah. No, I do consider myself one of the more non-attractive female porn stars. Uh, I always say like, I didn't have like a rise to fame. I had like a very like slow burn of like, I just never went away. And people were like, well, I guess she's still here. (laughs) You know, so so I just kind of gained fame by never leaving, but I certainly <laughs> didn't do it by being like this like beautiful new bombshell coming onto the scene. And I didn't start out being sexy either. I had to learn sexuality in porn. Like mm. I got into porn strictly for like, I needed some finances like set my way so I could really pursue my comedy career. And I was super awkward on set and just not sexy. And I remember I got with a, when I got with Kendra Lust as my agent, this was several years ago. That was forever ago that she had an agency. Yeah. But she had said to me, she goes, I want you, because she goes, the reason you're not working as much is because you don't sell sexy. She was like, I want you to watch some of the bigger porn stars and some of their porns and watch what they're doing versus what you're doing. And that was so huge for me because no one had ever given me that kind of a feedback before. I didn't know I wasn't sexy. <laughs> so that was no news to me. <laughs> so, so I did go and I started watching other women that were 
selling really well. And I was like, she's right. They are giving more eye contact. They're talking more. They're doing different things than I was doing. I was Mm -hmm. very scared to be sexual. Mm -hmm. And I was afraid for anyone to know I was sexual also. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I like found that sexual energy and like changed like how I performed and started acting in scenes as opposed to just being like there having sex with somebody for money. Um, And it kind of like changed my porn career around, but yeah. Wow. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah. Then I kind of gained a little bit of success there. Yeah. Cause I think guys really want to watch a girl that looks like they're enjoying themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, it got me nominated for MILF Performer of the Year four times, you know, so that's fun. Got me playing with the big girls in the league. So mm-hmm. that was fun. Yeah. yeah. So you came in at 30. Yeah. So kind of tell us like specifically, because you you did say that you were doing comedy. So like why specifically did you come in? And do you feel like it was a good move that you came in later? In 110%. Life? A very good move coming in later in life. And I kind of wish that we had at least a 25 age year start instead of 18. Mm-hmm. Cause I think it's really hard for some of these girls to come in without any knowledge of the real world before getting into porn. I think mm-hmm. you should have some kind of real world knowledge. You should have to show up on time for a job yeah. <laughs> five days a week, work a 40 hour week and know how great it is to have a porn schedule. I think a lot of these people who come in don't really have any kind of work ethic. Mm -hmm. Um, around them and that's hard, nor do they know what normal people make for salaries and Mm -hmm. kind of what we're getting is above and beyond and to save it and save for your future and deal with those economics. But um, yeah, I'm so thankful I came in with real world knowledge. Coming in at 30 changed a lot, but I will say I still came in completely um, naive to everything. I didn't really know what porn had to offer. I actually was living in LA doing two different jobs, just trying to make my way as a comic. Um, but wasn't really doing any comedy because I was working so much just to stay afloat. Mm -hmm. I was in a total culture shock coming from Kansas city where I had a beautiful two bedroom apartment for $600 a month. And then I came out here and I had a studio for in a Cracker Jack box for 1800, you know, and just a shell shock of what it was. You couldn't even get that nowadays. Yeah. No, no way. Rent's insane. It's crazy. So it was complete shell shock. And I had a girlfriend who lived in Kansas city with me. Um, and she wanted to come out and do porn. That was like her goal forever, as long as I've known her. And at 22, she came out and she lived with me in my little studio apartment. And I saw her make like 10 grand her first week. And I was like, okay, if she can make 10 grand a week, like I am getting into this. Like, there's just no way I'm not. So I called my parents because I'm close with my family, really close. I called my parents. I was like, this is what I'm doing. Like, don't worry. Don't freak out. Like there's a lot of money involved. Like I'm doing it business wise. You know, I'm coming in business minded and, uh, that's exactly what I did. And I, how did they react? Not well. My mom is super religious. Ooh. Yeah. And still is. I mean, she could quote you the entire Bible if you would let her. Um, and my dad, my parents are divorced, which is uh-huh. great. My dad, of course, wishes I didn't. Um, but now uh, I think he's more proud of what I've accomplished with it, that I didn't kind of go off the rails and we were talking before this podcast, I have struggled with drug addiction in my past and I've struggled with depression and suicide and all those things. So I think more than anything, my father was worried about my mental health going into something like Mm this. Um, but again, it made me stronger, made me wiser, made me a better person, made me a better businesswoman. And I think my family now sees that. And as much as my mom still doesn't even want to like accept it, she doesn't tell people what I do. She tells people I'm an, uh, a model and that's where she leaves it, I you mean, know? So you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but my father at this point has gotten to a place of proud. Mm-hmm. He sees what I've done and isn't like afraid to tell people what I do. And he tells people about my comedy, which I talk about porn in my comedy. Mm-hmm. So, um, they're supportive now. My dad is for mm-hmm. sure. My brother just started working for me actually. So wow. yeah, I have an older brother who does mortgages in Kansas city and now he's managing my comedy career. So that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. So, um, 
Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial yes. break, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about your comedy career. Yes. I did watch a little bit of your stand-up, and it was fucking hilarious. Thank you. And stand-up <laughs> is, like, one of my hugest phobias. Oh. So, um, <laughs> all right, guys, we're going to be right back. We're going to talk more about Sylvia's comedy career and so much more, so hang tight. We live in a crazy, hectic world. We value the hustle more than we value peace of mind. And don't get me wrong, I'm 100% that kind of person. It's really hard for me to check out of work and check in with myself. This is why I love an app like Calm. Calm is a meditation app that has all kinds of programs to help you settle an anxious mind. Whether you're new to the meditation game or you're a pro, Calm has a program that's perfect for you. And if meditation feels like a little bit of a stretch right now, then Calm has other things like sleep stories, breathing exercises, or just simple relaxing sounds to help soothe your mind. Whether or not I've got five minutes or I've got an hour, Calm has the perfect program for me. And right now they're offering my listeners 40% off of a premium subscription. Go to calm.com slash holly to access this incredible offer. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash Holly to get 40% off of your subscription. That's access to literally hundreds of hours of content. Calm dot com slash Holly. All right, guys, we are back. So Sylvia, you do comedy, yes. which, you know, as I mentioned, is one of my like greatest. Fo- I have a terrible, I had a terrible experience in like, uh, <laughs> summer camp when I was like 10, like trying to do stand-up <laughs> comedy and like being so humiliated. And ever since then, it Aww. was one of the most embarrassing <laughs> moments of my life. And ever since then, I'm like that to me, I mean, forget taking yeah. your clothes off in front of the camera, right. getting up in front of a bunch of people and trying to tell jokes and make people laugh to me is the most terrifying thing you can do. And I almost like hate going to stand-up comedy shows because you feel there's always the that person who's mm-hmm. not funny mm-hmm. and no one's laughing. And like, I mm-hmm. die inside when that happens. Yeah, uh, I was that person um, on Tuesday night. <laughs> so um, it definitely still happens because, I mean, no matter what my point is in my career, I mean, I, I'm a headlining comic. I do, do 45 minute shows, but I have to try out new material like any other comic. Mm-hmm. So occasionally I'll go and try material and it does not land. And that was me on Tuesday night. And I was cringing and I'm like sweating and I'm on stage. Like, when is this over? I had to like resort to old material that I know, you know, does well and does good with crowds. But um, it is definitely a terrifying feeling. I'm still terrified every single time I go on stage. I try and like hype myself up so much beforehand. Like you're going to be the funniest person there. It's going to be great. And then they're like, Hey, Sylvia, you're next. And then I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to shit myself. They're going to hate me. (laughs) Do I have to pee? Like, Oh my God. It just becomes like you just this psychological, like fuck up. And then the first like three minutes on stage, I'm usually shaking my, if anyone ever looks at the hand I hold a microphone with, this is me for the first like three jokes. And then as soon as like, I know I'm in like a zone, I'm like, okay, Mm -hmm. now I can like relax and breathe. But it is terrifying because you never know when you're going to bomb. You don't know what audience is going to love you and which one's going to hate you. And I bombed in front of a lot of friends the other night. And that was more embarrassing than anything because I'll go and do stages, you know, if I don't know the people and like if a joke doesn't go well, I'm like, ah, fuck it. I'll never see those people again. Mm-hmm. But in front of friends and colleagues and other comedians, it was like this happened on Tuesday and every single mm, like hour I get that flush over me going, oh, you made a fool of yourself. Oh, my God, you made a fool of yourself. <laughs> so um, I just have to keep remembering that I was funny uh, a week prior to that so I can be funny again. <laughs> you know. So it just, uh, it comes in waves and you really can't control those waves. It's just an ocean out there of comedy. And occasionally you just get smacked to the ground and it's your choice. If you want to get back up there and go out again. And for 10 years, I've been picking myself up and going back out into the ocean. So yeah, it, yeah. Getting I getting better at surfing. I saw your stand up where you <laughs> talked about playing a stepmom. Yes. And like, you know, that they just give you ki- it was so good. Yeah. And I know that you did the Netflix as a joke comedy yes. festival recently. That was what on the seventh, I think? 
Uh, I couldn't tell you the date now to save my life. Um, yeah, I think so. Cause actually I was texting with Cherie. Yes. And I think Aaliyah and Mike, Yes, and they were talking about your show and mm-hmm. how they were, I think, I know at least Cherie was going Yes, and I couldn't go because I have a child and I have no life, but I was like, Oh, I'm going to have her on my show soon. So, yes. but so how did it go? Uh, the show was fantastic. It was probably the best comedy set I've done in years. I felt amazing about it. I had a ton of friends and the audience audience, including Cherie, um, September Rain, <clears throat> a few other big names. Um, and then come to find out it meant nothing uh, because <laughs> Netflix is a joke is the festival and they kind of put it up all over just to bring like the big upcoming comics to uh, stage fronts and they promoted the hell out of it and they put our names on all of these billboards and these ads to millions of people, which is fantastic for exposure for me, but no one will ever see that comedy because it wasn't taped. It will not be on a special. And that's how every one of the comics was kind of sold to it. So, I mean, I had an out of town gig that was a $3,000 gig that I lost money on. I hired a hair and makeup artist for that. I bought a new outfit for the day. I did it. The whole nine yards thinking this was going to be like a life changing moment for me. I canceled everything I had the whole week to like rehearse in my apartment. And I did comedy naked in front of my mirror. I was like going to all the levels. And then right after the show, they were like, oh, yeah, it wasn't filmed. It won't be on anything. And I was like, oh, okay. Then I went into a full depression for like three days. <laughs> Why wouldn't you film it? I mean, that's fucking yeah. free content. Yeah. Well, and God knows like Netflix just like. They need content. They need content so bad. The fact that I'm watching dubbed over series from every other country on Netflix right now tells me how bad they need comment. Com- oh my God, content. Wow, content, the words. Yeah, yeah there they are. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wish they would have. They didn't even film it from the Laugh Factory. Not only was Netflix not there filming, but even the Laugh Factory did not film anyone's sets. Did anybody get it on their phone? I don't not know. You're not allowed to film in like big comedy clubs like that. They like X. <sighs> They tell you right beforehand if you have your phone out. It's I'm like, so yeah, sorry. yeah, it's fine. I can laugh about it now, but then it was like one of those moments again where it's like, oh, I just ruined everything, yeah. you know. But you could do that set again. Oh, 110 percent, yeah. And I, I will do it again. What were some of like the best jokes? Do you think, or like the best like little stories that you told? <sighs> Um, well, anything I do porn related always goes over so extremely well. I do a joke where I talk about, um, how 98% of the men in this world eat vagina wrong Mm -hmm. and how that's a statistic I came up with all by myself, but still incredibly accurate. And then I describe to them how you should appropriately eat vagina. And that joke is one of the, uh, crowd favorites. I've been doing the joke for probably five years now, and I've never gotten it out of my set only because there's not a single show that I've done it where someone hasn't come up to me afterwards and been like, that was not an amazing, not only an amazing joke, but extremely educational. And I'm like, you're welcome. Take it home. <laughs> please, please take it home and implement it into your life. But yeah, so that's my, my one and like only go to. And I call it my I, I, I joke because it's, you know, yeah. how women need repetition on their vagina and uh, don't make a capital I. You just a little, little I and you dot it. Just I, 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 like on a woman's vagina, you know, five, <laughs> 10 minutes. It's that thing. So yeah, I won't tell the whole joke because it is a long joke. Right. Yeah. Now you also have a podcast. I do. So tell us about that. Uh, So my podcast is called Sexy Funny Raw. It's a sex education podcast. I have switched it up over the years. Uh, I've been doing the podcast for six years now. So I've gone from guest to no guest during quarantine. Um, So I'm back in the studio now with, we're having hour long segments, but I'm reinventing again now and we're actually bringing on a MD to the show. So it will be instead of just my medical background, which I had, um, mixed with my porn career. Now it will be actual medical advice from a doctor as well, where he can correct me when I make a wrong statement. So yeah, but it's really just sex stories and making sex comfortable and talkable and it's funny. Sex is hilarious. There are so many things in the sex world that, are so great. And people have so many good sex stories that that's really what I want to do is just bring people on and like, let's talk about the things that got awkward during sex, you know, or like talk about the things that were awesome during sex or the things that were awful during sex, but just a way to make it 
a normal subject and not so taboo, which is crazy. Yeah. I would have loved to have grown up in a family like yours, by the way, where sex was an open table subject, but Mm -hmm. that's, I didn't even masturbate till I was 19 because I was so afraid Jesus was watching. So I just, (laughs) yeah, I grew up very like Southern Baptist and we just didn't touch ourselves. And, you know, I, like I said, I didn't do drugs in high school because I was holier than now. And Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be around anybody who would put themselves through that, you know, Mm -hmm. even then I got myself a meth addiction just a couple years later. (laughs) (laughs) Um, karma is real. Um, but yeah, it just, um, I don't know. I went off on a tangent and I lost myself there. I'm That's back. Okay. There That's we okay. are. We were talking about your podcast. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Sex education mm-hmm. with a comedic twist. Right. Yeah. What are, are you, do you take like questions from guests or anything like, I'm sorry, questions from the listeners audience. or anything like that? Yeah, we definitely do. Um, I don't have a place for them to submit them right now, but that's something I want to change with the show. Normally mm-hmm. it's just like, if they leave a comment, I'll mm-hmm. address it in the next segment. But mm-hmm. what do you find, like what kind of, what topics do you think are the most important ones to tackle? Um, well, I always want to talk about safety. So I do a lot about the STDs and, um, checking and testing. I do a lot about like just physical health and cleaning. I worked in healthcare for nearly a decade prior to being in porn. And I didn't know proper health care of my own vagina Mm. and anus until getting into porn. I wasn't, um, familiar with any of my areas before porn. I didn't know how to wash them properly. I didn't know how to, um, maintain a healthy pH balance before. I didn't know even like it's little things. And I know a lot of women who are still doing this, Googling the discharge that comes out of their vagina because we don't talk about it. So they don't know what's a healthy discharge versus what is an unhealthy discharge. And I was also one of those women at 30, at 30 with a medical background, I still was Googling what is happening to my body. Mm -hmm. And I was Googling, should I wash my butt first? Should I wash my vagina first? Because I didn't know how to, I had a I was having problems with BV, mm-hmm. which a lot of people um, don't know. It's a bacterial infection that happens in the vagina. And a lot of it stems from incorrect cleaning of your vagina, whether mm-hmm. the woman is wiping her vagina wrong or cleaning it wrong. And so I had to go in and do my own research of why I kept getting BV over and over and over again. And it was my own improper techniques. Mm -hmm. It, you know, had some to do with obviously probably changing my sex partners as often as I was and not knowing how to keep the pHs, um, balanced, but I've learned so much in porn and I just want to give that back to people. So I think that's probably one of the most important topics is like keeping it actually healthy and clean penises and vaginas and buttholes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And also too, when you do porn, I mean, you obviously like have sex with so many different people. I think the repetition helps you learn about your body and figure out what works for you and what doesn't because everybody's different. Mm -hmm. I remember there was this one girl who actually wouldn't let other girls finger her because she was like, I was always getting bacterial infections. And she was like, it's the nails because we don't think about it. Not cleaning underneath. Not cleaning underneath the nails. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of like- It's all those All kinds of stuff. So- so then she found that if she, and you know, obviously like the other performer would sometimes be a little bit weird about it, but I think right. when she described it, they were okay. She would like have a nail brush. She was yeah. Like, Can Go you scrub? scrub underneath your nails mm-hmm. before? Otherwise, like I, I will get an mm-hmm. infection. And I had never thought about that either. Yeah. And I was like, that just makes so much sense. It does. It's all those things. Even on sets, I don't do like oil stuff because- mm-hmm oil upsets my pH. And yeah. so a lot of people want to do all these oil scenes. I'm like, no, I just won't even put my body through that. Cause yeah. I already know what it's going to do to me. The different types of lubes will change yeah. from person to person. Even the latex you're using will change from person to person. It's mm-hmm. just things that no one knows because no one tells us. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know what your sex education was like in school, but ours was basically abstinence. Okay. So yeah, exactly. I, I honestly don't remember ever having a sex education class. I remember ours being don't have sex until you're married and then showing us all the diseases. Like they had a book of like what uh, the worst case of herpes would ever look like, mm-hmm. the worst case of syphilis would ever look like. You know where it's they've just got sores covering every aspect mm-hmm. of their face and it's like that's what we were shown. 
don't have sex or this happens. Mm -hmm. Like these are your options. Yeah. <laughs> so I just, I don't, I don't think sex education should come from porn, no. but it might be good to come from porn actors. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Telling you the, the, the yeses and the nos and what's real and what's real in porn and what's fake mm -hmm. in porn, you know, yeah. everything is fake in porn. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes even the cum shot is fake and porn, you know? So it just Xetaphil yeah. works wonders, but you gotta get yeah. the special kind of face wash. I think it's a sensitive right. skin face wash. That looks like cum. The other right. stuff looks like lotion. I've made that mistake before and it's very problematic. And let me tell you something: trying to whip up fake cum yes. on set. I've, put, I've done like sugar and mm -hmm. egg yolks and yep. flour. And I'm just like sitting there like trying to make cum. Like, I'm like, does this look like cum yeah. here? Like, let me put this on your face. <laughs> no, it doesn't look like cum. Let me add more egg yeah. yolk. It's so fucked up, but it's so true. You know, my favorite one to ever use was somebody used pina colada mix. Yes, because that's also like Tastes delicious. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, because putting Cetaphil on your mouth, it's also, the worst. And it can make your tongue kind of numb. Oh, yeah. I've never, I always, if they put Cetaphil, I do the. Yeah, mm. it's got to go here. But some girls, like, they want to, yeah. like, make it look real yeah. and have it drip out of their mouth. So you're don't... not paying me enough for that. I know. I'm always surprised. <laughs> All of some girls will be like, no, 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 put it in my mouth. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> right. They're like, yeah. I'm like, it's face wash. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay. You're literally washing your mouth out with soap right yeah. now. <laughs> there you go, you dirty girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, no, but yeah, the pina colada was my favorite, but you can't put that in a vagina because mm -hmm. then of course you're going to ruin pHs and mm -hmm. all sorts of things. So, yeah. yeah. So if you have to do a fake, um, cream pie, yes. uh, for me, spunk lubes worked pretty well. Cause that looks very much like yeah. cum, but some people may see, I can't even do fake, um, cream pies because my vagina eats it. The moment you put anything, like even on the outside, my vagina is like, for us, and it just takes it back. <laughs> so, same, same with my butt. They've never been able to successfully fake a cream pie with me. They're like, where did it go? I'm like, oh, it's in here. It's going to live in here for a while. Wait, what do you mean? It just like sucks. It's just like, <laughs> yes. like a fucking like yes. sea an enemy. Yes. And it's going to live there until probably I'm just walking through an airport or something, and then it's just going to... With way out of me. So have you ever been booked for a cream pie scene and like it just. Yes. Yes. On multiple occasions. And I always tell them like, this won't work for me. I don't even book them anymore. I won't yeah. even do a cream pie scene because yeah. for one, I won't do a real cream pie right. just because um, I am on birth control. But my biggest fear is a porn baby. Like I yeah. think that is like the scariest thing in the world, not knowing who this father could be amongst the mm -hmm. whatever guys I had sex with that week. Um, that's terrifying. Uh, so cream pies in general scare me, but I would do fake cream pies for a while. And then mm -hmm. I just quit doing those either. Cause I'm yeah. like, it doesn't work. You guys can shoot so much up me and it will not come back out. Like it just won't drain. I don't have a drainable body. I don't know <laughs> what it is, <laughs> but my body is like, we're going to keep that moisture. That's uh, what <laughs> we're almost really 40. Dangerous. We're almost 40. Give it. <laughs> we're keeping it. We're going to save it for later. <laughs> <laughs> what my body really does. Oh my God. Oh my God. I do so feel good. like I have definitely, that has changed for me. If I am not truly, truly turned on by a man, there is no moisture in my vagina. Like you have got to do something to like turn me on. Mm -hmm. And then it's fine. It works like a normal mm -hmm. vagina should, but it's not like in my twenties where I could just like be wet forever. Mm -hmm. I definitely have noticed a change in the internal climate of my body. Right. <laughs> so what's age. the best way for a man to turn you on? For me, it's the intimacy, mm -hmm. uh, which is hard on a porn set, obviously. Yeah. Um, which is why I say I try to really find a connection with people or look into their eyes and look at their soul and like try to find them as a good person. Um, but yeah, for me, it's the kissing. Like if I love my ears being sucked on, if someone mm -hmm. comes to my ears and my neck, for me, that's like super sensual mm -hmm. and fingering, which no one does anymore. I, I am very upset by the no finger game. I remember mm -hmm. in high school that being like one of the things I loved right. more than anything was being fingered in the back of someone's car. And now no one ever fingers me. And that's what I... I'm bringing back fingering. Can we just bring it back? I want someone to kiss my ears and uh, kiss my neck and finger me. And then I'm I'm in it. I'm ready. That doesn't feel like a lot yeah. to ask for. I don't like, think so just either. Just kiss my neck and finger me. Yeah. Very basics. But, you know, again, like it's different for everyone. Um, I actually 
very much dislike being fingered. Really? I don't like it at all. Oh, see, I guess it is. Yeah. yeah. Everyone is totally different. But, but this is why like communication is great, which yeah. I, I would assume that you've probably gotten better at with porn. Yes. Because, you know, so many of us like in the real world, we don't, we pretend like we like everything our partner is doing to yes. us because it feels awkward to talk about how they're not doing things right. I still kind of do that in my real life. To be fair. So I mean, as much as I want to be like, no, no, no. You still want to like give them that boost of confidence that mm -hmm. they're with you. And mm -hmm. then sometimes I also don't want to be like condescending to them. You know, I'm yeah. like, you're doing a good job, but you're not really. It could be yeah. so much better. It could be better. Like it the compliment be. sandwich. Like, so this yeah. is good. <laughs> But then like this part's not so good, but then you're like really trying. Yeah. So, and see, I tried that with a guy I had been seeing recently and I think it kind of backfired in my face, but yeah. I had said it about his kissing style. There was at one point where he kissed me like really passionately and like held me and like brought me in and like, it was a passionate makeout. And after that happened, I mentioned to him, I said, I loved that kiss, by the way, that kiss was the best kiss we've ever had. I said, I would like more of that. Like that to me is hot. And he took it as every other kiss has been bad. <laughs> and so it did not go over well. And I am not even seeing that person anymore because wow. of like the comments I made to his kissing style. And I was like, Oh, I didn't mean it like a bad, like everything else has been awful, but yeah. I specifically wanted more of this more yeah. like passion, you know? It's like when my husband tells me that I look good today, I'm like, what do I look like <laughs> shit every other day? Yes. yes. I'm just kidding. I don't do that. But, <laughs> but that's exactly what it was. That's what yeah. it turned into. And it kind of backfired in my face. So again, it's, it's easier to just do the you're doing great. This is this yeah, but is also really like, do you really want to like date this. somebody that like no, can't take constructive feedback? Yeah, no. Like, think about all the other areas in your life that that could bleed into and be a problem. Yeah, and I would want someone to tell me honestly yeah. if I were yeah. doing something wrong. I would want the feedback, but man, it's hard, even with porn. And I can do it in a porn, but my real life again, it's just so much harder. I don't know why. Is it? Because, yeah, I mean, because I guess we're dealing with other people who aren't in the industry, so communication might be difficult for them. Or it's just like, I mean, porn is like very constructed fantasy, right? Yeah. There's like, there's like four, there's communication beforehand. I mean, yeah. I know on our sets, like we have a boundary checklist that we yeah. go over mm -hmm. and, you know, I have the performers talk about what they like and they don't like. So like all of so this true. thing is very like discuss black and white. Black and, white. Mm -hmm. and so when you get into it, you're like, okay. And you're also working with other professionals, uh -huh. right. Who know yep. what they're doing or yep. gen I mean, not always, but right. You know, can read body cues, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, you're but so right. I wish I could do a checklist before I sleep with people. Actually, mm -hmm. these are my, these are my nose. These are the things I do not want you doing. these are the, we should, that should be a thing in real life. Maybe you could start like a dating app that has that. Yes. Cause what a weird conversation to have when you're in it. That's mm -hmm. what it feels like. Yeah. That's what it, cause you're like, you don't want to lose that passion. You're like, oh, yeah. I really want to have sex with this person. And then you have sex with them and you're like, womp, womp. Yeah. this was not at all what I had built up in my head, but they can't know what you've built up in your head, you yeah. know, without you telling them what you want. Right. You know? So yeah. Okay. I need to be a better communicator in life. That's uh I dated a taking. guy who I had like a BDSM relationship once with this one guy who was like a dom. And, um, I remember, and I was like, you know, into BDSM, but I didn't have like a ton of experience yeah. with it. And I was definitely interested in experiencing more. And he gave me a checklist. Wow. This was like 15 years ago or something like that. Yeah. And I remember him giving me a checklist and he was like, okay, and I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Were you offended or did you? I was uncomfortable. Okay. I was surprised and uncomfortable. Okay. Because I was like, you really want me to, <laughs> to like t talk about all this stuff? Like yeah. it just, but I oh, mean. Oh, like he was telling you what he wants to hear and things of that nature. He just wanted, I mean, I think, I don't know how much BDSM you've done, but there's little. like, there's a lot of, in a responsible BDSM relationship right. and on a responsible BDSM set, like kink, um, they're very particular yeah. about, I mean, they were doing checklists, mm -hmm. boundary checklists way before the rest of us. Right. On. Yeah. So, um, so they're very good because they're doing pretty extreme shit to yeah. you. Like mm -hmm. you got to like you're know tied what up, you're in gagged. for. Yeah. 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 And yeah. like be game for it. And they have to like know yeah. what your limits are and you need to know what your limits are. Yeah. So, um, 
So like it was, I don't know. Yeah, I was just surprised. I think I was also too like a little bit, I think now I would have handled that in a much better way. Yeah. But at the time I think it was a little bit like. Kinda, a little green. Yeah, and a little bit like immature about it. Yeah. Um, I think I just wanted it to be like this fantasy and everything would be great and like everything would be fine. Though, I mean, we did communicate about stuff. He wanted to like lock me in a cage and I wasn't into that. Mm, yeah. It was just a large dog kennel and mm. I just didn't want to go in a mm-hmm. large dog kennel. He's I, like, but I'll put like a fluffy like rug down for you. And I was like, yeah, no, thank no, you. I'm good. Yeah. Good. I have a hard time that this is something I've had to deal with in porn is realizing that my limits are not everybody else's limits. Cause mm-hmm. I've been offended for people mm-hmm. that will go into a cage like that or, or, or be in any way degraded in a mm-hmm. porn. And I will come to bat for that person and then come to find out later. They were like, actually, no, I was really into that. And I'm like, okay, different boundaries. We all have different boundaries. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I, <laughs> I remember a, a guy friend of mine had shown me, it was like a, 10 dudes and they were all wearing masks. Uh, you couldn't see anybody's faces. And then this little girl in the middle and she was just drowned in all of their cum. And I thought, how degrading for her. And I was so mad at the guy friend of mine for even being a part of it. And I was like, how disgusting. You don't know the mental damage you just did to this little girl, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, do you want to see her interview before this, that she was begging for something like this to happen, that she wanted it? This was her fantasy. And I was like, oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Not everyone has the same boundaries. <laughs> it's like, but to me, I would kill myself if, it, that if I were that little girl in that video yeah. and it got out to anyone, you yeah. know? So yeah, I don't know. Different strokes for different folks. And then again, and I've done some she things. she was kind of young since you're yes. saying like, I mean, obviously yeah. over the age of 18. Yes. But, you know, yeah. Saying but like, a younger girl. A younger sure. girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everyone to us who's like under the age yes. of 30 is like a little girl. That's <laughs> yes, how I feel. That's I'm like, exactly. oh, you're like 25. You're so fucking young. <laughs> that's how I feel all the time. I say kids a lot and I say it in my comedy and that's where I always have to like reference, you know, yeah. of like what it is. Because yeah. I always say I'm fucking these kids and people are like so offended. I'm like, ah, oh, they're 18 consenting adults, you know? Yeah. 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 If they can go to war, they can fuck. So So, (laughs) they're here on their own devices, but yeah. yeah. But it's interesting because I think that that viewpoint that you just talked about where you were felt offended for that, that girl, um, I think is the lens that a lot of people view porn through all the time because people see themselves, they're like, I could never do such a thing. Mm -hmm. So therefore that person must feel the same way I do Mm -hmm. about everything else, Mm -hmm. about sex and all of these things. So they must be, you know, feeling really degraded, but they don't want to say it for whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like part of the reason that I started this podcast because I was like, no, like everyone doesn't feel like that. Some of these bitches are crazy. <laughs> yes. They like crazy shit. So and true. they really like crazy yeah. shit. So I'm like, not one of those girls, but I know them. <laughs> but so like, let them come and sit down yeah. and tell you that they like that crazy shit. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like, you look at some of the stuff that like a great example is Casey Calvert. Uh-huh. You look yeah. at some of the, cr- that bitch does crazy yeah, shit. Yeah, she does, yeah. But she is one of she the- loves it. She's so together. She's so intelligent. She She is is. very good at setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like she's, she's got her shit together. Like nobody is like pulling the wool over Casey Calvert's eyes. Like she, she, everything that she does, she is a hundred percent there for. So, you know, I think people like that is just a great example of like, everybody's got their different tastes Yeah. you know, like what we do in the bedroom or on camera, right. You know, is, is that. Yes. And then who you are outside of that is that. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's so true. And thank you for making that point because I don't often look at it like that. I'm always like, why can't people just see me as a person? You're right. Because they can't see themselves Mm -hmm. doing that. Yeah. So yeah, I get it. I think sometimes for people, they have to almost make you like a non-person to like accept watching you in that way. Mm Because I've had friends of mine be like, I know you do porn, but I can't watch it because I just know you, you oh, know? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. you can though. I, I'm okay with it. If yeah. you watch it, I wouldn't put it out there if I weren't okay with it. Right. But I do understand that because it takes a personal aspect away from it. Oh, I'm the same. Yeah. I mean, people ask me like, if I watch porn, I'm like, no, because I know everybody. Yeah, like I cannot watch porn mm-hmm. where I, if I know you mm-hmm. and we've like talked about like your family yeah. <laughs> or, you know, like, your hobbies, like, 
No. I scroll. I do still watch I porn, can't. but I will scroll through. I find myself watching a lot of the uh, No Face Girl mm-hmm. because, for one, I've never met her. I don't know who what she is in real life. She's got a great body, and I don't see her face, mm-hmm. and I don't see her partner's faces. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, that I can watch, but mm-hmm. you're right. I will scroll for pages, and I'm like, oh, my God, I know all these people. I can't watch any of these people. <laughs> and you know what will happen to me, too? I'll find a scene that like looks hot, and I don't know the girl. Yeah. And like the guy's head's chopped off. Yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm watching it, and it's like five minutes in, and then the camera moves, and it's like Ryan McClain. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> Right. Done. Done. So true. God damn it. It's funny you now say I that. Now I feel weird. That just happened to me with Ryan McClain <laughs> on a porn I was watching the other day. And I was like, that kind of looks like Ryan McClain. But the guy kept hiding. His yeah. face was out of it for yeah. so much. And then finally it was exactly that. They panned up and I was like, that's fucking Ryan. And then that's all I was thinking. Yeah. It was like about my friend Ryan. Yeah. And he's like <laughs> the nicest guy. And like. He's so, and like, I, you know what I mean? And he's like <laughs> yeah. being like this aggressive. I'm like, that's not Ryan. Ryan's aggressive not like in that. Sex. That's so funny that you say yeah. that. He turns into, the, he turns a switch on for yeah. the camera. But he's like the nicest guy <laughs> in person. So I'm like, yeah. Ryan, you're not really like I that. I know. Come on. He, he goes to pulling hair and like choking in a porn. And I'm like, okay, buddy. <laughs> it's not your personality. It would be like if Sean Alf started choking people out on. <laughs> It's sad. You're like, this is not you. It's so funny. <laughs> but yeah, it ruins it. Knowing yeah. the people definitely ruins it. Yeah. That's so hilarious. I understand like, it's funny because some people have watched this podcast and been like, you've ruined porn for me. Yeah. And then other people are like, oh, like now I feel better about watching porn okay. from watching this podcast because now go. I like know that these women. They like it. They like it. You yeah. know, they're not being victimized. So like it goes both ways. Honestly, I cannot be more thankful to porn and the people I've met in porn. I mean, Sheree is now what I consider one of my very good friends. Alexis, these are super powerful business women mm-hmm. who are just really good souls. And I've met that in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. And now not everybody in porn is awesome, but not anybody, everybody in any profession is right. awesome. There are people who are going to try to take advantage of you in every aspect in life. And porn is no exception to that. Mm-hmm. But it made me financially independent. It made me a stronger, more confident person. It made me a better lover. It made me more understanding person, made me more empathetic person. I wouldn't change it for anything. It opened up so many more doors than it closed. I just cannot be more thankful for the my porn journey. And I don't even know if it's over yet. I haven't worked for studios in several months, but that's only because I'm getting my nose done next month. So I'm going to come back with my new face. Mm. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I probably get a, I think I want to do a good decade in porn and then, and then make my exit, but who knows? I also started porn saying I want to do two years and here we are eight years later. Yeah. So it's also super hard to exit. Mm-hmm. It is one of the hardest places to leave ever. Cause yeah. I just, I don't know, for me, I guess, because I love it so much. I No, I think that's probably true for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to think about going back and doing anything else. Right. Yeah. When my job is to have orgasms. <laughs> right. It's like flying first class and then yes. having to go, go back, back to, to coach. coach. How? Yeah. It happened to me once and it was really disappointing. <laughs> Flew first class once in my life. <gasps> And I've ever since then, I've only flown but, economy and it's just like, oh no, I only fly first class because I can't go back to economy. And every time I purchase a ticket, I hate myself. I hate myself because I'm like, I'm spending so much more money on this fucking ticket and I can't even sit and coach over again. Yeah. I can buy Southwest tickets for myself to Vegas. And that's the only, that's as, f- that's as far because I'm like, they don't have a first class. So, and it's a fucking 40 minute flight, girl. Yeah. Get on this plane with other people <laughs> for 40 fucking minutes for $70 as opposed to $700 yeah. to sit in first class for that same 40 minute fucking flight. And yeah. I just, but that yeah, it's, it's atrocious. That's I can't crazy. do it again. I can't go back to economy. They're not nice back there. That's the problem is it's how you're treated. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the seat itself. Cause I don't need a big seat. I'm not a big girl. It has to do with how nice they are to you yeah. in first class. It's quite shocking. I remember <laughs> yeah. walking onto first class and they like had champagne yes. and cakes waiting for me. I'm like, <laughs> right. This is real life. They, What's going on here? They call you by your, uh, uh, like miss you know what miss sage or whatever they call you by your name the whole time and like what can i get for you anything else i can do for you what can i help i had a broken seat one time in first class and so every time i wanted to recline i had to call the flight attendant over to come move my seat manually and he moved my seat manually so many times and then kept asking do you need anything else do you need to use the restroom it was like 
crazy. Yeah. I had one time where I, I um, dipped my breast into um, the chicken plate I was eating and my flight attendant took the shirt I was wearing and washed and had my shirt hand washed and dried for me to put back on by the time I walk off the plane in first class. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now this was pre COVID obviously, right. but yeah, it's a whole new, it's a different experience and you can't go back. <laughs> Well, Sylvia, I think you're a first class lady oh, and I want to thank you so much for coming onto this show. This no, was thank you. so much fun. I had a great time. Thank you. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Yes. So you can find me, um, at, on Instagram at the Sylvia Sage and there you can link into my link bio that will send you to everything else, which is my only fans, my comedy website, um, my YouTube where you can find my sexy, funny, raw podcast. And it's also streaming on all podcast streaming sites. Fantastic. And you guys can find me as always at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And one of my videos hit over a million views on TikTok. So my TikTok's blowing up, but it's also simultaneously threatening to delete me. Ugh. So this may not be relevant by the time. I'm this podcast comes up, but for now I'm on TikTok at Holly Randall unfiltered. And of course, if you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered, where we're going to do a little bonus Q and a with your questions for Sylvia. So again, thank you guys so much for joining me and I'll see you next week. Bye.